Hello everyone, my name is Mandeep uh, Virk and uh, I will be talking about shoulder instability today. It's uh, a pretty big topic but you are definitely going to be tested on this. Uh, I'll cover this talk uh, under these subheadings. We all know that uh, glenohumeral joint has excellent mobility but this comes at the expense of instability. Shoulder is the most commonly dislocated joint in the body. And there are multiple reasons for it. It is a non-constrained joint with a configuration of round ball on a flat socket compared to a classic ball and socket joint, which is like a hip joint. The articular circumference of humeral head is more than three times that of glenoid, which provides an increased rotational range of motion compared to a joint like a hip. The motion in the shoulder joint is not purely a pivot rotation but also involves translation especially at the extremes which provides additional end range of motion to the shoulder. There are three key players that determine glenohumeral joint stability and critical deficiency of one or more of these players can result in glenohumeral instability. The first one is the glenohumeral ligaments. The capsule and the ligaments provide ligamentous support to the shoulder. They act as static check reins, especially at the extreme of motion. They're in form of capsular thickenings. We all know the superior glenohumeral, the middle, and the inferior glenohumeral ligament. In this slide, the take-home message is that the Anterior band of IGHL is the most important ligamentous restra anterior restraint for end range abduction and external rotation. The MGHL plays a more important role in mid range of abduction, and coracohumeral ligament and SGHL are important restraint for inferior translation at zero degrees of abduction. The rotator cuff muscles are the dynamic stabilizers and they act throughout the arc of motion. They produce concavity compression but in which they compress the humeral head into the glenoid fossa in line with the glenoid axis, which resists the shearing forces produced by the large muscles acting around the shoulder. But at the same time, they also provide a smooth pivot and translation motion without causing any subluxation or dislocation. The glenoid and humeral head bone stock is the third most important factor that provides stability. Critical unipolar or bipolar bone loss can result in recurrent shoulder instability. Shoulder stability is particularly sensitive to glenoid bone loss and there is exponential effect of glenoid bone loss on instability because the size of the glenoid is way smaller than that of the humeral head so very small loss on the glenoid side results in a lot more instability for the same amount of loss on the humeral head. The glenoid bone loss typically affects the anterior inferior rim of the glenoid which is the most important critical buttress to anterior translation so even small losses in this location pronounce the instability effect on the shoulder. The instability associated with bone loss has certain characteristic features compared to the instability pattern seen without bone loss. With bone loss, there is higher frequency of instability events in a given period of time. There's greater degree of apprehension. Instability is typically seen at low angles of abduction or during sleep, which is typically not seen in patients with just soft tissue injuries. Two mechanisms have been described to explain the pattern of instability associated with bone loss. One is loss of glenoid arc, which presents as a mid-range instability. And the second mechanism of engagement is the engagement of hill sacs lesion with the anterior glenoid rim, which happens typically at end range of instability in the provocative position of abduction and external rotation. Estimation of critical or significant bone loss is an ongoing debate. Different techniques have been described for measurement of glenoid bone loss and hill sacs lesion. 
3D CT is the gold standard for estimation of glenoid bone loss and size of the hill sacs lesion. Critical bone loss on the glenoid side is defined as a loss of more than 25% of glenoid width and majority of people agree with it, although certain newer studies are describing as lot less amount of uh, bone loss as a critical definition. Uh, the, there is less consensus on determination of critical size of hill sac lesion, but majority of people agree that a hill sac defect more than 30 to 40 percent of the humeral head circumference is considered critical in isolated uh, situation. Critical bipolar bone loss is even more controversial and uh, is still an ongoing debate, and this has led to the concept of uh, glenoid tract by Dr. Itoi. As we all know, only a part of the humeral head circumference articulates with the glenoid at a given time. So glenoid tract was defined as a contact zone between the posterior humeral head and the glenoid when the arm moves along the posterior end range of motion. It is dynamic, as you can see here. The track moves from inferior medial to superior lateral location with increasing abduction and external rotation. The width of this glenoid track uh, is 83% of the maximum glenoid width, and it extends from the most medial attachment of the rotator cuff towards the articular surface of the humeral head. So the glenoid track help the concept of glenoid track helps us understand the concept of engaging or off and on track lesion. The engaging lesion or an on track lesion concepts are complementary, just uh, presented by two different set of authors. The take home message from this slide is that being on track is protective for the hill sax lesion. Being on track is protective for the hill sax lesion. So if the hill sax lesion, as you can see here, is on the glenoid track, it will not engage the anterior rim of the glenoid during an athletic range of motion, which typically is described as 90 degrees of abduction and external rotation. Whereas if the hill sac lesion is either located off the glenoid track or is big enough that it falls outside the track, it will engage in, a, in the provocative range of motion and result in dislocation. Again, in this slide, you can see this hill sax lesion is on the glenoid track and is not engaging in this provocative position. Whereas this hill sax lesion, even though it, it is of the same size, it is off the track because the glenoid has an anterior rim deficiency which reduces the width of the glenoid track. So the risk of engagement of a hill sax lesion is higher if there is anterior glenoid bone loss because the glenoid tract will become smaller. For example, in this picture, you can see here the glenoid arc is intact. The same hill sax lesion is now engaging because the glenoid arc is smaller and the glenoid tract is smaller as a result of loss of glenoid bone loss. If the hill sax lesion is bigger or more medial, for example here, the hill sax lesion is pretty big. For a normal glenoid tract, it is way too big and it engages. Whereas in this figure, the hill sax lesion of same size but more medially placed is engaging just because of the location. In addition to all these things, presence of shoulder laxity, either intrinsic or acquired as a result of capsulolabral tear can make a borderline hill sax lesion on track become off track because of laxity. Uh, there are certain other uh, factors that provide stability, may not be critical determinants, but do contribute to shoulder stability. Glenoid labrum is one of them. It provides firm attachment to the capsule and glenohumeral ligaments on the glenoid side. It increases the glenoid depth from 2.5 to 5 millimeter, which increases the surface area of contact for the humeral head. The anterior inferior labrum, which is a strong buttress against anterior inferior instability, is firmly attached to the labrum. 
Other less commonly discussed stabilizing factors include bony and soft tissue restraints like the coracoid and conjoint tendon anteriorly, the subscapularis tendon we have already discussed in the rotator cuff, the acromion posterior superiorly, the coracochromial arch superiorly, and the adhesion cohesion phenomenon or the suction cup phenomenon which provides restraint to inferior translation. Now, shoulder instability is defined as loss of concentricity and glenohumer of glenohumeral articulation. It could be in form of subluxation or dislocation. We all know anterior dislocation is more common than posterior and that young patients are more prone to shoulder instability partly due to high level of activity and soft tissue laxity and partly due to factors that we don't understand well. As far as the pathology is concerned, uh, this is a busy slide, but the take home is that the Bancourt lesion is still the essential, Bancourt lesion or its variant is still the essential lesion. Hillsack's lesion uh, is present in 65% of patients with first dislocation and 84 to 93% in recurrent dislocation. Other pathologies seen include greater tuberosity fractures, bony bank cards, capsular injuries and avulsions, injury to the long head of the biceps or rotator cuff tears, and neurologic injuries. We'll talk about the uh, majority of these in, up, in next slides. Again, a very busy slide, I apologize, but this is, this is something that you can be tested on and they love to ask about ALPSA lesions, about the HAGL and uh, in which the scapular periosteum is disrupted or not, so I've highlighted those things. So Bancourt lesion, essential lesion, it involves disruption of the anterior inferior capsule labral structures along with disruption of scapular periosteum. And the importance of that is that if you have an MR orthogram with a Bancourt lesion, there will be no dipole on the medial side of the glenoid neck because the periosteum is disrupted. In contrast to the Elpsa lesion, which is basically a periosteal sleeve avulsion along with the capsule and the labrum, which forms a pocket in which the dye will pool and that's the reason why you will have those typical MRI findings. So no disruption of periosteum on Alps lesion. Likewise, uh, you can read about the other, uh, the other definitions on this slide. And one other important thing is that in GLAD lesion, there's no disruption of the scapular periosteum and it does not typically result in instability. It is more of a pain producing lesion. Long-term effects of shoulder instability and glenohumeral joint. This is basically the results of uh, Hovelius 10 and 25 year data. You guys can read this, but the take home message is that uh, the dislocation arthropathy increases with time. They have uh, given a number of one unit percentage per year they use the uh, Semelson uh, classification, which kind of exaggerates uh, the arthropathy findings. Uh, and uh, the, the reason I'm saying that is because majority of patients with the percentage arthritis that they are describing have not required any kind of a shoulder replacement. The other uh, important finding from this study is that there is a potential for surgery to alter the natural history of arthropathy because they found that surgical stabilized shoulders uh, had less arthropathy than those shoulders which did not get surgery but got stabilized over a period of time after having recurrent dislocations. So risk factors for instability associated arthro arthropathy includes age at primary dislocation Surprisingly, younger age has less incidence of arthropathy. So if you dislocate before 25, your chances of having arthropathy is less compared to that of uh, a guy who dislocates after 35. Presence of recurrent instability, high energy sports and alcohol abuse predisposes to a higher risk for post-dislocation arthropathy. Imaging, the first line imaging uh, for me is uh, a Gracie axillary and a scapular Y view. Uh, alternatives to axillary view you can be tested on the West Point, uh, the Velpal, the Garth, 
uh, and uh, then the Bernageau view, which I'll uh, talk about in the next slides. Advanced imaging for me is typically if I indicate a patient for surgery, MRI if I suspect predominantly soft tissue abnormalities, and CT scan with 3D reconstruction if I'm addressing bone loss. So Bernageau view uh, is uh, basically a special view that uh, focuses on the anterior glenoid rim. If you look at it, it basically looks like an axillary view, except for the fact that the acromion superimposition is not present. So you can see the glenoid rims very clearly. So if the glenoid rim erosion is there, it will give you a blunted angle sign. If you have lost a lot of bone, then you'll have this cliff sign, which basically means that this cliff present on a normal shoulder is missing now and then rim fractures can be seen. Uh, I don't do Bernageau views in acute dislocations because it's very hard for a patient to go in this position so these are typically done for patients who have recurrent instabilities. So glenoid bone loss can be measured on 2D CT. Different methods have been described. The two most popular methods are the best fit circle method and the glenoid index method. Similarly, on a 3D CT, the glenoid index method and PICO's method are the most commonly used methods. Measurement of hill sac lesion, there's less consensus on measurement criteria. Uh, hill sac can, lesion can be measured both on axial and sagittal views. You could either describe it as uh, the size of the lesion, which involves calculating the maximum depth and width of the lesion, or it can be described as percentage involvement of the articular circumference as 20, 40 percent and things like that. So when a patient presents with uh, a shoulder, first time shoulder dislocation, there are a lot of uh, important points that you have to know in the history because uh, these uh, uh, questions have an important bearing on uh, the mechanism involved on the uh, risk of recurrence, uh, treatment options, and future, uh, future outcomes after surgery. So knowing what was the, first, uh, what was the age at the first dislocation, uh, the kind of sport that a person plays, uh, did patient require self uh, require a trip to the ER to get it reduced, do they have uh, any neurologic symptoms? Do they dislocate in sleep or in low abduction angles? And each one of this has an important implication. In physical examination, um, you know, a routine uh, shoulder examination, in addition, you have to pay attention to make sure you don't miss any neurologic findings, especially suprascapular nerve involvement. Uh, and uh, also looking for shoulder laxity because both these things have an important bearing on your decision for surgery. It's important to differentiate between laxity and instability. Uh, laxity is uh, the degree of translation of the joint in different planes, which, uh, which uh, varies from one individual to another. The instability, on the other hand, is a combination of increased translation associated with discomfort or pain. So laxity in its extreme may result in instability, but typically it does not equate with instability. For example, here, the tests for shoulder laxity are sulcus sign, load and shift test, presence of external rotation more than 85 degrees, and they by itself don't mean instability. For instability, you have basically apprehension tests, the anterior apprehension for anterior instability, posterior apprehension for posterior instability. Uh, in this slide, the take-home message is that if the Biden score is more than four, patient has a generalized ligament laxity, which goes by this fancy name of joint hypermobility. It is not synonymous with joint hypermobility syndrome, which is more pathologic uh, and involves certain other criteria, which are judged by so-called the Bryden's criteria, which is different than the Biden score, which is used for assessing or determining ligament laxity. So Brighton and Biton are different. So what, as surgeons, what do we want to know in a, in a patient, in a patient, in a patient who has, we want to know, we want to know what would be the risk of recurrence of this patient? Is surgery necessary to minimize this risk of recurrence? And what kind of surgery will give us the least risk? Recurrence? 
So answers to some of these questions come from learning natural history of any condition. So looking at the natural history of shoulder instability, we know that rate of recurrence after a first time dislocation is variable and depends on multiple factors, but the ballpark number is approximately 50% in patients less than 35 years. This risk is highest in first two to five years and over the period of time, the shoulder stabilizes. Age is a strong independent predictor of risk of recurrence. Less than 20 year old has a very, very high risk of recurrence. Bone loss on the glenoid or the humeral side is associated with higher rate of recurrence. These are the two independent risk factors. Other risk factors are male gender, collision contact athlete, presence of shoulder laxity and involvement of dominant arm, and the risk of recurrence in this at-risk population can be reduced by instability repair. Treatment options are non-operative arthroscopic repair, which includes both Bancard and the remplissage, the open Bancard repair and capsular shift and bone block procedures. So a lot of controversies with management of first-time dislocator, the kind of treatment, op versus non-op, the timing of surgery, the type of surgery, and return to play. So non-operative treatment includes immobilization and physical therapy with or without bracing. Indication, majority of patients with acute first-time dislocation are treated without surgery unless they have associated lesions like a rotator cuff tear or critical size bone loss on the humeral head or the glenoid side, or they play a particular kind of sport that puts them at a very high risk for a recurrent dislocation. Immobilization, the duration of immobilization is controversial. Anywhere between one to six weeks has been demonstrated in both level one and level two studies without any ill effects. Uh, the position of immobilization, external rotation versus internal rotation, controversial, but currently available best evidence demonstrates that immobilization and external rotation does not provide any advantage over the standard immobilization in internal rotation. Uh, bracing is controversial. It is used by athletes, but there are no studies that demonstrate a reduced incidence of instability with bracing. Return to play, non-surgical treatment allows fastest return to play as early as one week, but the average reported is two to three weeks. There's a one-third rule, uh, which means that one-third of patients after first dislocation will complete a season without recurrence, one-third will complete a season with a recurrence, and one-third won't be able to complete the season. Prerequisites for return to play are having a pain-free shoulder with full, near full range of motion and scapular strength with or without a brace. So surgical treatment, uh, as I mentioned before, falls into three categories. The indications are a presence of a rotator cuff tear, uh, a glenoid defect more than 25%, a humeral head uh, lesion more than 25 to 40%. Relative indications are presence of two dislocations within a season, age less than 20 years, and a contact on an overhead athlete. Again, the relative indications are more, uh, I think, as a tool to address the athletic population, but absolute indications apply to everybody. Is open uh, better than scope or other way around a scope better than open? Uh, orthoscopic instability repair is as good as open bank card repair. It has been shown in level one and level three studies. Uh, but there is an, uh, a hint that open bank card repair may be more durable in a contact athlete, but the evidence is weak. Shoulder terrible tried uh, basically means, a sh as you guys all know, shoulder dislocation with a cuff tear and uh, axillary nerve injury or brachial plexopathy. It's a devastating injury. Uh, axillary nerve is uh, commonly injured, but other nerves have been fairly well described, including the musculocutaneous, suprascapular, and the posterior cord. Uh, the treatment is to proceed with immediate uh, rotator cuff repair or the greater tuberosity repair and wait for the axillary nerve to recover. If there's more dense neuropathy, especially brachial plexopathy, it may require exploration. So typical recurrence rate after an arthroscopic bank card repair, if it is done well, is anywhere in the range of 10 to 15%. The open bank card also hovers around the same number, 
maybe one or two percent less. If uh, orthoscopic bank cord repair is done in presence of critical bone loss, the risk of recurrence is to the tune of 70% or higher using uh, an open bone block procedure, either in form of a Laroche or Eden Hibernet procedure is less than 5%. So what's the risk of recurrence? What factors predispose to recurrence after orthoscopic bank cord repair? The most important factor that you need to remember is glenoid bone loss and bipolar bone loss. It is the strongest independent risk factor predisposing to recurrence after bank heart. Other factors are uh, young age less than 20 years, which is why a lot of uh, European and French surgeons want to do uh, primary ladder jays. Uh, presence of shoulder laxity, uh, inadequate surgical technique, which means less than three anchors below the equator. Increase uh, time interval between the first dislocation and surgery, presence of higher number of dislocations prior to surgery, and male gender all predisposed to risk of recurrence. Uh, so Pascal and uh, colleagues have uh, come up with this scoring system to predict uh, the risk of recurrence after orthoscopic bank heart repair. This is not a scoring system to decide who needs surgery. So you, uh, everyone is well aware of uh, the score. Uh, the take-home point is score more than six has a high recurrence uh, if uh, orthoscopic bank card repair is done, but a score less than six has a regular risk of recurrence uh, of approximately 10%. Then coming to the Latter-day procedure, which uh, everybody is well aware is a coracoid uh, Moving uh, is a uh, is a procedure in which the coracoid process is transferred uh, to the glenoid in order to reconstruct the anterior part of the glenoid. Uh, the indications is glenoid bone loss more than 20 25 percent, uh, failed prior instability repair, orthoscopic or open as long as it was done well, which means uh, three or more anchors uh, in sub equatorial position of the glenoid. Another soft indication for me is recurrent instability in a patient with poor quality capsule labral tissue with more than 10-15 dislocations and uh, a borderline bone loss. Relative contraindications are voluntary dislocation, um, patients with multidirectional instability, and patients with uh, muscle patterning. So uh, how does the uh, Laroche procedure work? Uh, the triple block effect has been defined. One is the bony effect, which means that the glenoid arc is restored, which will now convert uh, off-track lesion to an on-track lesion and will also prevent mid-range instability. The sling effect, which is a dynamic soft tissue buttress formed by the lower half or lower one-third of the subscapularis muscle by the conjoint tendon that traverses through it. And the bumper or the ligament effect, which is the ligamentous reinforcement by the CA ligament of the anterior capsule. So it's an excellent operation for addressing unipolar or bipolar bone loss. It has a very low recurrence rate with excellent outcomes, but it is less forgiving compared to an orthoscopic or an open instability repair, basically because of uh, complications that can be dangerous. Uh, orthoscopic ladder J uh, thing to know is that recent studies are showing equivalent results to open bank card without increased risk of complications. But the initial studies uh, showed a very high risk of neurologic injuries. Uh, complications, graft osteolysis is the most common radiographic finding seen in up to 60% of cases. Non-union rates range from 1% to 9%, higher in smokers. Recurrent dislocation, we mentioned, in less than 5%. So nerve injuries with open are approximately 1%. The most common nerve is musculocutaneous. If there's a suprascapular neuropathy, you should uh, make sure that the superiormost screw of the graft is not tickling the nerve, and that can be presented as a clinical vignette uh, uh, during test taking. Uh, vascular injury is less than 1%. Other uh, complications are graft fracture, hardware failure, which is more common. I don't have the exact uh, incidence. Risk of arthritis, uh, not exactly known, but Walsh says uh, 20% at 20 years. Uh, you can be tested as uh, the uh, like what predisposes to risk of arthritis, and uh, a lateral overhang of the graft has been shown to correlate with a high risk of uh, arthritis.
Remplissage, which we all know is orthoscopic capsule or tenodesis of the posterior capsule and infraspinatus tendon to fill the hill sacs lesion. Indication is an off-track hill sac lesion with or without glenoid bone loss. If there's no glenoid bone loss, then you do it with an orthoscopic uh, procedure. And if it is with, then you're doing it even with an open procedure. Outcomes, it does reduce the risk of uh, instability in patients with off-track hill sacs lesion. Uh, but there is a, law, a risk of loss of external rotation, uh, range of motion, and strength, uh, even though the original study said that there's no loss of external rotation. But recent uh, uh, randomized studies have shown that uh, it does result in uh, loss of uh, strength and rotation, but uh, the, amount of, uh, the amount of range of motion loss does not affect the quality of life. So I think this is a good summary slide uh, which shows uh, uh, the gu a guide to uh, instability surgeries with bone loss. So if you have a glenoid defect that is more than 25%, you need a Laraget. If the lesion is engaging, then you will have to treat the humeral side, which is the hill sacs lesion, either with a bone graft or a remplissage. If the glenoid defect is less than 25%, then the hill sacs lesion, if is engaging, will require a remplissage along with orthoscopic Bencart repair. And if it is non-engaging, you can just do an orthoscopic Bencart repair without any additional procedures. But this is in presence of bone loss. So thank you very much for uh, listening. If you guys have any questions, you can email me and I'll be happy to answer. Good luck.